section. And uh, let's turn to Revelation chapter 1. And we, we started the first part a few weeks back. But we're going to be going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And let's look at Revelation chapter 1. The title of the message is, Jesus is Magnificent. Jesus is Magnificent. And we're going to uh, read verses 9 through 20 and then do a little review. So, verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the, the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as, it, as if refined in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches let's pray together Lord Jesus, what a privilege it is to be living, Lord, at the, at the end of the age, Lord. We don't know the day and the hour, but we see, Lord, all the signs and prophecies coming to pass. And we get to, Lord, apply truth, live the truth uh, in real time, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's exciting, Lord, to be with you. It's exciting to walk with you, Lord. It's it's, Lord, the greatest adventure to know you and to walk in your ways. And we pray that you equip us, Lord, and answer some of our questions in the book of Revelation. And, and just show us great and mighty things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is a fun story. But Sam uh, brought his friend uh, to, to the church. And, uh, and so after the service, he introduced him to the pastor and shook his hand. And, and the pastor said, hey... Um, do you want to be a part of the army of the Lord? And, uh, and so, um, you know, his, uh, his friend said, well, I already am a part of the army of the Lord. And the pastor said, well, um, I only see you like on Christmas and Easter. And he said, pastor, I'm in the secret service. So, <laughs> no, but we got to kind of chuckle, right? Is that we need to show up more than Christmas and Easter uh, we can't be in the secret service. We need to be out, amen, in the community and in the church and alive and a part of, of what God's doing. And um, because the revelation is, is the book actually means consummation. It's a consummation of all things. In Latin, it's revelation. In Greek, it's the apocalypse. And so it's the, the finalization but I want to go back for some review. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. 
and then we're going to get into the text. But it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So the revelation in, in you know, you, every time you read it, there's a blessing. We're going to talk about that. But it's Jesus Christ is, is communicating to John, but through the angel. So it's almost as if, and John gets a little bit fooled by it himself, and we're going to go to Revelations 22. But Jesus is maintaining his heavenly presence and in his glorified state, and he is communicating through the angel as if he's just speaking. And John is, is writing. He's, it's, it's like dictation. It's, it's totally unique in, you know, all men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Bible covers 1,600 years, 40 different authors. And each one was led by the Holy Spirit. But this is the last book and John did have such a dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ that literally the angel is telling him what to write and he's writing it down on the scroll. There's not going to be a review on it. He's just going to write it down on that one, one foot by 30 foot scroll. He's just writing. His wrist must be strong because he's going to write it out. And, uh, but let's go to Revelations 22 and we'll see here that all this is John's writing Jesus is speaking the angel is communicating translating and then it comes to revelations 22 verses 8 and 9 and it says now I John saw and heard these things and when I heard and saw I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things and he said to me See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So John is a, a ready writer, and he's, he's writing this down, and he was banished to the island of Patmos, which was, is about 40 miles out from, um, from the coast of Turkey. But if you want to talk in biblical um, time in Asia, he was about like 46 miles from Ephesus where he was a pastor. So this was the place that they would take prisoners to. And uh, the Roman emperor was Domitian. And he was so insecure, so demon-possessed, that he was killing Christians, locking them up. He didn't want anything to compete with himself because he wanted to be worshipped as the emperor of Rome. And so John had such an amazing stature. And so instead of killing him, he banished him to the island of Patmos. And uh, Ignatius, one of the church fathers, uh, said... Uh, verbatim that he went over about 95 after the death of Christ so it could have been also around the age that he was but it was he's probably about 95 or so years old but it's 95 uh, years and so he is is banished but he's able to write he's able to have uh, you know like writing material He's not doing hard labor, and so it's just a unique time. He's, God set him aside, you know, out of the persecution. Even though he's in a prison, I'm sure it was not comfortable, but he's able to write. And then during this persecution, uh, then a new emperor came in. And uh, so in Revelations, it's, it's this book that is the consummation. It's full of analogies. It's full of symbols and metaphors. But we have the privilege of living in the, at the end of the age so that we can learn from 2,000. Remember, he said, I'm coming quickly. So to us, 2,000 years, you know, is a long time. But in relative time, it's, it's not. It's 2,000 years. And, um, and so now he's writing to us. 
And he's, he's giving us an understanding. So we're blessed to be able to interpret the, the prophecies. You know, we, we can see what a tank looks like. We can see what a drone looks like. We can see a lot of these symbols that John was writing because he's in the first century. He didn't have any knowledge of, or, or he never, so visually he was seeing it. He was, he was writing it down. He was interpreting, he was dictating but he didn't know what a tank looked like. He didn't know what the internet looked like. He didn't know, you know, what AI was. But we do. And, and it's amazing that we, we're living in these times. So there's a special blessing for those who read the book of Revelation. And that's why we're being blessed. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you're being double blessed. Because there's, it's the, it, it, we're blessed when we read the Bible, the whole Bible, and every day. But there's a special blessing that comes from reading the book of Revelation. Because it reveals God's plan for the future. And it's saying that God is a finisher. You're a finisher. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. What God starts, he finishes. And what God has called you to do, you're a finisher. That's the character of Christ. You stay faithful to your marriage. You stay faithful to your job. You stay faithful, you know, to your family, to your church. You stay faithful. Amen. God's a finisher. God's got character. God, God is eternal. And he's saying, I'm bringing this to a conclusion. And, um, and, and, and as we look from Genesis to Revelation, I just want to give this in review because it's so powerful. In, in Genesis, man is put in the garden and it's perfect. But because man sinned, he was thrown out of the garden. He couldn't go back in. But in Revelations, they're back in the garden. Revelations uh, chapter 21 and 22, they're back in the garden. So in Genesis, it shows how man lost his chance to eat from the tree of life. But then in Revelation, man is back, Revelations 22, 2, and he's eating from the tree of life. You see, it's the full cycle. So in Genesis, you know, it tells about man's first rebellion against God. And then in Revelations, promises to end man's rebellion against God. There's going to be no more rebellion against God in heaven. And then in Genesis, uh, it records the first murder, the first drunk, the first rebel. But then in Revelations, the prom it's a promise of a city where nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anything who, who does evil uh, or what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's revelation. So in Genesis, it, said, it reveals the tragic sorrow of, of result from sin. But then in Revelation... It's the promise that he wipes away every tear from their eyes. Revelations 21.4. So he is going to fulfill everything. That's why we want to stay with him. Stay with the program. Amen. Don't let any slack develop in your relationship with God. If there's some slack there, then repent. Because there's some darkness there. And we just need God to bring the light. That's all. So that more revelation can come. Genesis records the first death. And then Revelation talks about there is no more death in Revelations 21.4. Genesis shows the beginning of the curse. But then in Revelation, the curse is lifted. There's no more curse. Glory to God. And now, because we're under the blood of Jesus, there is no more curse. There's no more curse on your life unless you curse yourself or believe the enemy. But he has lifted the curse already. Amen. Because we're in his kingdom. So... In Genesis, it, it, it introduces the devil, and the first time is the tempter who came to tempt Adam and Eve. And then in Revelation, it shows how Satan is totally defeated. Satan, where, you know, he's crushed in Genesis 3.15, and then he's locked up forever. Revelations 20, verse 10. So there's going to be no more devil. Glory be to God but righteousness and holiness. And so those are just beautiful things about Revelation. So Jesus' appearance is magnificent. And uh, there was a, a neat uh, pastor's daughter. Her name was Helen Lamel, And uh, she was born in 1864. And she passed uh, the year I was born, 1961. 
But Helen uh, came over from England with her father, who was a preacher. He was a Methodist preacher. And she was on fire for God, and she joined up with the revival with Dwight L. Moody in, in 1918 and uh, in Chicago. And so there was a powerful move of God, and people were getting saved. And so she, she got on their worship team, and she was a writer. But somebody had given her a pamphlet, and it goes like this. So then turn your eyes upon him, look full in his face, and you will find that the things of earth will acquire a strange new dimness. Now somebody handed her that track, and then she, she being a songwriter and gifted, she put it to music, and we all know it from 1918. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light and this glory and grace. So see, she got that. that and, and we've been singing it. It's so beautiful. And that's Jesus. We're looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that's why we're looking in Revelation. That's why there's a double blessing because we're seeing through all of this and seeing the conclusion. Now, what does Jesus look like? This is, this is so powerful. We use this slide here because it's such a beautiful testimony. And you can Google it if you want. But her name is uh, Achaia. Or it's, it's, it, it, her nickname is Katie. And her, her parents immigrated from the Ukraine, and they were living in Illinois. But she just was, got this gift at four years of age to do artwork. Four years of age. Her parents are agnostics or atheists. They don't believe in God. So little Katie, um, she's like painting at four and, uh, and at at eight years of age, she painted this picture of Jesus. In 40 hours, she painted this picture of Jesus. And, um, and it's, you know, it's like from the heart of a child. I mean, it's God saying, I might look something like that. You know what I'm saying? Is that, you, and, and here's what, um, here's what uh, Michael Green, he wrote a book. It's called, Who, Who Is This Jesus? And he makes a suggestion and what he does is he talks about what an Israelite Jew would look like at that time, okay? And still to this day. And this is what he wrote. He would be, um, Jesus was tall enough so that people could see him in a crowd. The color of his skin would be olive. His eyes greenish brown with a distinguished Jewish nose. Jews had in Israel brownish black hair. And usually wore it long and carefully groomed. They valued a full beard. And it appears on many of the coins of that day. So in other words, this is very much, I mean, it was a gift from God, right, to humanity. It's, it's proven and, and she uh, was given this. But does it really matter? The Bible doesn't say what color eyes Jesus had. The Bible doesn't say what color skin he had. We can make assumptions. It doesn't say how tall he was or how strong he was. But we knew he had to be strong to carry the cross, right? But what he's saying is, is in the Bible is, is it doesn't really matter because it's the content of your character. It's not what color your eyes are or your skin is or how, how tall you are. It's the content of your character and the ability of you to perceive, right, the the love of God in, in his character. But John is, is, he's so humbled by this situation that, you know, John is the last, he's the last apostle. All the others have been martyred. Judas had betrayed him. He's the last of the last. He, he could have boasted a little bit of himself, you know, like I'm the last one hanging out in this. No, but there's nothing like that from John. He's selfless. And he's saying, you know, I'm on this island and, and it's a kingdom of tribulation and patience and uh and so he's he's just being patient like you and i turn to your neighbor and tell him now be patient be patient because you're a part of the kingdom and it's unfolding but john is saying it's a kingdom of patience and endurance and and by the way the kingdom that we're in we're not in the kingdom of rome okay 
We're not in, we're in the kingdom of God. We're in God's kingdom, God's time, God's plan, God's protection. Amen. And the more than that's why when we get born again, we understand these things. And it was so beautiful. I was up at Cow's Mount. It was just unusual on Friday. But two sets of, 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 of women, they were like 20 years old, but they, they all got born again. It was just supernatural. I was like building a cross and these two gals come up and they're like watching and I said, do you know Jesus? And they're like, and, and so I go up and I talk to them and they're from a Catholic background. They don't know if they would die, where they would go. But they said, you know, we are, we're seeking God more now in our life. And I said, well, you know, God brought you here and let's, let's pray. And they asked Jesus into their heart. They got born again. And then these two Chaldean uh, young women were like, they were like, they, they want to be good, but they don't know how. They're just hoping. They go to the priest and they're going to do confession. And, and, I, and I said to them, you know, that you can, Lena, Maria, you can be born again right now. And so it was beautiful. But see, God wants to take the veil away from our eyes and he wants us to be born again, but he wants us to be energized each and every day to know him more. And, uh, but we, we go through these tribulations because we live in a fallen world. That's why. That's why it explains it, why we go through sometimes sickness and we, we go through weather patterns and we, we go through financial stresses and all this. It's because we live in a fallen world. But one day God's going to make it perfect. But until then, we have to persevere just like the apostles did. And, they're, and John's on this island of Patmos. But it's so interesting that he was there for one year under Domitian, who was just brutal and killing Christians. But then Domitian got killed and removed. And then the next emperor was Nerva. And then he was much more lighter on the Christians. So then John could go back after 18 months. He could go back to the mainland and be the pastor of the, of the church in Ephesus. But let's look at verse 10. It's, it's full of uh, revelation. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a, a loud voice of a trumpet. So John was in the spirit. See, we always can be in two places. We're here at church, but we're in the spirit. You can be at work, and then you can be in the spirit. You can be doing dishes at home, and you're doing that, but you can be in the spirit. Because John said that, that on the Lord's day. Now, here's another one for the first day of the week. I, if I ask you, I don't want to trick you, but the first day of the week is not Monday. The first day of the week is Sunday. That's why when Jesus rose from the grave, it was right there in the first century when he appeared to them on the first day of the week. That's why we attend church on Sunday. The Jewish nation still goes to church on Saturday, but Jesus changed it. And by the way, he's God. And if he wants to change things around, he's a, we'll give him permission, right? That's why we go to church on Sunday. So on the first day of the week, John's he's a prisoner and he's worshiping God. He's, I'm sure he got some other prisoners around him and they're worshiping God right and and uh, and he gets this revelation so every Christian uh, makes that that choice to get you know to get those downloads from God let's look at verse 11 and it says saying I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last what you see write in a book and send it to the seven churches and so it was this um, papyra um, it was it was glued together in these strips but it was a roll like 30 feet long and about a foot wide and he just you know with a pen with a quill pen was just writing away even that in itself the preservation of the scriptures is miraculous the preservation of the book of Revelation and then it was copied and copied and copied but the originals is that God has preserved you know when you think of all the inclement weather and the snowstorms and the rain and the sun and all the but God preserved the scriptures for us God he's given it to us amen the original manuscripts are right before you nothing has changed they're all original amen and so this is what he was given and then uh, these seven churches where the message is going out to, the seven churches were, um, were also, they were, they were all founded, most of them by Paul, the apostle. Because Paul 
preached in Ephesus. And then Paul, um, there's a letter in Colossians 4.16 and it says, take the same letter that you got from Ephesus and go take it to Laodicea. So the same letter was copied and then it went to Laodicea. So all the churches that he's mentioning have been evangelized and Paul was the main apostle. And of course there were others that were involved. So let's look at verse 12. It says, Then I turned to see a voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now this is so awesome because there's patterns. See, in the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. We, don't, we need the Old Testament. Nothing's going to change, but it's been fulfilled. So we get, we get the full blessings of the foundation of the Old and the New. But it's talking about the menorah was given to Moses in the tabernacle. So, you know, and we've been there to the Creation, History, and Earth Museum. And you see that menorah there that represents the light, right, in, in the, as they went in and confessed their sins and brought in their animal sacrifices. But now there's another menorah that's the light of the seven churches. See the pattern? Is that the church now is to be the light. And then the seven, isn't it interesting that there's seven continents? Hmm, I wonder, God, you know, when he broke it all up in the flood, God broke up the big, you know, flat map and squished mountains and made all this stuff. But he created seven continents. And then so there's seven there. And then there's also uh, seven, you know, all the different denominations that there are and movements and that. So what he's saying is there's a variety in the body of Christ. There's the seven lamps uh, represent the light going out to the nations. And so um, we, we are a part of that, that light going out. Now, as uh, the title Jesus is Magnificent, we're seeing here that... If Jesus is in his heavenly state, and we know that John was very close to Jesus, and we know that he would lean on his shoulder just to, just to listen to him, you know? And uh, so there was a real strong attachment here, and it's like Jesus has to be, he has to work his heavenly position, and then through the angel, he's giving John, you know, this information, because John hasn't finished his race yet. He still got away some years to go, and uh, and so Jesus is there. But John gets to see Jesus in his glorified state. So number one, John says, "One like the Son of Man." So he identified in verse thirteen. He says, "In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man." What John is saying, he says, "I see Jesus." Because that's what he would write all the time. He's the son of man in his writing. So he sees Jesus in his glorified state. And so, um, and then number two is he's dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. And it was typical of a long robe of a high priest who would minister in the temple. So he's got a long robe, and we know from the Mount of Transfiguration, it was a white robe. And so, you know, but we don't know exactly from here, but it's a, it's a robe, and it represents, Jesus is our high priest. He's making, he's making prayers for us. He's made perfect sacrifice for us. See, that's why we can't get in through good works. We can't get in through our stature. We can't get in through money. We can only get in because he's our high priest and we've received him. And then he loves us and then we give and we do things, but it's not based on good works. It's based on what he has done for us. He's our high priest. And number three, there's a golden sash around his chest and his belt. In this band of pure gold was a mark of tri triumphant royalty. Triumphant royalty. So Jesus is not only our high priest, but he's also our king. He's our king forever. And what a righteous king. A king that's looking out for your best interests. A king that loves you. He's not jealous over you. He's not competing against you. He's confident. He's a blesser. Amen. He's a king forever. He's the king of righteousness and he's in our hearts. And so number four, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. The whiteness of his hair represents absolute purity. So he's omnipotent. Omnipotent is a Greek word, means he's all-powerful. And that's why it is kind of humorous that in English society, which is... Um, 
you know, we were, we're a part of England. We came out of England, which was a Ro part of the Roman Empire. We're one of the sons of Tarshish. We're, we're one of the sons, the young lions. America is one of the young lions. Australia is one of the young lions. Canada is one of the young lions of Tarshish, which is um, ancient uh, Britain. And so in Britain, you know what they would do? They'd, they always look so funny when you see them in movies and they have the big white wings. Wig. The big white wig. Maybe, you know, a, a, a bald man or a man with another color hair, but he put on a big white wig there and then they transferred it over. And then in the Americas, you know, the wigs were a little bit older and probably a little bit dustier, but they put on those white wigs because it showed wisdom. It showed that they were being sober. It was, see, it's all symbolism, but Jesus has this, this white hair, which means he's all powerful and he's just. And number five, his eyes were like blazing fire and his penetrating wisdom and righteous judgment. And so, you know how it says in Psalms 139 that, 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 that the Lord knew us when we were in our mother's tummy. He knew us. He, he's, he's all knowing, right? He's all powerful. He's all seeing. He's omnipresent. And so that's what he's saying with those blazing eyes. He's looking to protect you. He's looking to bless you. That's why we, we want to we wanna be humble before the Lord. We don't want to be, you know, little rebels like, can I get away with this? And, and it's like, well, you know what? God asked for forgiveness and we're, you know, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the more that we mature, the more that we realize if God is watching and he's good, I think I'm going to do things God's way <laughs> because he sees it anyways and he wants to bless me. And so I don't want to, you know, de-bless myself. That's not an English word, but de-bless myself <laughs> by living in disobedience, right? When he's already seeing, he's got those blazing eyes of love, but he also is going to judge. And then number six, his feet are like bronze glowing in a furnace. The bronze speaks of judgment, brazen at the altar, the temple. He can walk through fire and he is going to judge all evil with those bronze feet. It means that nothing can harm him or touch him. And as long as we stay right with him, nothing can ultimately harm us or touch us because he is. And this same vision that John has is the almost identical vision that Daniel had. And John is saying he's the son of man. Daniel knows him as the living God. All right, so in, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, you can read that if you want, and you can see it's the same vision of God, and now, you know, John is getting that same vision of, of the majesty. You know, he's, and so Jesus triumphs over all evil, um, so the symbolisms, the reality, he's all-knowing, he's all-seeing, he's all-powerful, and he's all-good. And so, number seven, his voice sounded like the rushing of water. Now, how many of you here have ever been to the Niagara Falls? The Niagara Falls. Well, it, my, my wife and I, and, and we took our kids there, and uh, it is powerful, powerful. The sound, it is just, you know, you can't get away from it. It's a pounding sound, and, and, and yet this sound is so powerful, and um, you know, as a street preacher, sometimes I've learned, you know, preaching in Europe and preaching in, in Boston and in different places, sometimes you got to raise your voice and you got some rebels in there, so I just raise it a little bit more. I raise it above the rebel so that I can get the, the message out. And, uh, uh, but anyways, there's, there's an art to it. But God in his, and sometimes you just got to tone down. If they don't want to hear, you just tone down. Okay, well, but see... There's a lot of people that don't want to listen to Jesus today. You notice that? Have you seen that around you? There's a lot of people out there. They're like, did he really say that? That there's a hell? And did he really die? Ah, oh, it's a bunch of foolishness. And give me another drink. And, you know, give me another doobie. Uh, you know, but a lot of people, they don't want to listen to him today. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. When he comes, they're going to have to listen. 
They're going to have to listen, and we hope that their hearts are right before him. He's just given us time, and he's so humble, but he, his, his, the voice, we just saw that video, you know, the power of God, but yet he, he, he manages us to live, you know, a, a life of peace and relative safety, because, but he is all-powerful. And so his voice, and then number eight, his right hand has held the seven stars, and the seven stars are like the seven angels. And there's different interpretations. They could also be like pastoral, uh, like care over the seven churches. So it could be leadership. So a good pastor is supposed to be protective and guarding and loving and, and illuminating the word. But the angels that we have that are over us and over this church, amen, is also. So John is saying that in there's different, uh, different breakdown of, of light and protection, right? So he's just saying that there's angelic protection over the churches and there's pastoral protection over the churches and that there's ultimately God's protection is over the church. So that's why I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we need to be in a physical church as well as the church in our heart because we need the accountability. We need the fellowship. We need to share. We need to speak. We need to live out life together in that has always been God's plan. So number nine, this one is he's got a double-edged sword in his mouth. And so that's the same one in Revelations 19.15 when he comes to fight against the Antichrist. So when we've come from being seven years, you know, in the, um, after the rapture, we'll be up there. What are we doing up there? We're up there getting trained. We're up there worshiping God. We're up there finding how, how, our, how our supernatural bodies work. Amen. And then he, we got a plan, but we come back to the earth in the millennium. Amen. That's, uh, that's the reality of the seventh day, which is the millennium, when there's no more devil, and then we get to, you know, we get to rule and reign with Christ. But when we come back, he's got the double-edged sword, and he does all the fighting. So he's like the big brother, you know? Like, go get him, you know? Go get him. And so he takes care of the Antichrist and the 200 million men army, and he, he uh, wipes them out, and they all liquid, they're all liquid liquidated, and they go down to hell. But then, um, so there's a powerful, but that's why, you know, you have the Word of God in your hand. And, and the Bible is, the Word of God is sharp and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces as to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it's able to judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And that's the Word of God that is before us that we're reading. And that we can, you know, allow that sword to cut us and heal us and restore us and protect us, right? So that's, that's Jesus. Number 10 his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance, the element of the vision of John. And um, he is the son of righteousness. Like we saw that eclipse just recently, and, and, and we were here on the, on the church campus, and so Diane and Frank and Law were all out there with our funny glasses that Law got us, and we're like looking at the, the eclipse, and I'm telling you, like, you can't with the naked eye, you cannot look at that sun very long, and you're going to lose your eyesight. You literally will go blind if you look at it too much. But you put on those crazy glasses and you look up there and you're like, whoa, you can see it. But, but what is God saying? He, it's like John said he was as bright as the sun, you know. And, um, and so he's so, he's so bright and, and he loves us so much. But the light is, the light is in the healing and, um, and the light is where we can come and be cleansed and we can, and other people can be cleansed and God can heal families and God can heal bodies and God can restore, but we've got to acknowledge the power of, of the Son of, of God. And so John sees all these things and what's his reaction? He falls down and he's like, he's just beside himself 
And, uh, and that's the way we should too, is just worship God. Keep a humble heart, a worshiping heart. Don't let bitterness enter our heart. Don't let, don't let a lust devil jump on your back. Get it off. Get it off in Jesus' name. Amen. Is that, you know, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And, and uh, there's no sin that's not common to man. But with the, with, with the sin, God will provide a way to escape it. If we choose, you know, to fear God and run to God and to go through the process. So in conclusion, is that as we're looking at the book of Revelation and seeing uh, John's vision here, is that we see that Jesus is the master of all time and all eternity. Time is his. And that's why give him your time. Give him, you know, that time in the morning and check in with the creator and, and talk to him and love on him and get instruction from him and get into the word of God. And, and so because time is his and life is his. Life is his. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I know that when we get saved, then we realize, whoa, you know, and, and when, before we were saved, we thought we were Number uno, right? We were in charge. We'd do whatever we want. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And, you know, and then, well, how did that work out? You know, <laughs> but it doesn't work out too good. So what happens is, is that Jesus is in charge over life. And then also, number three, is that he is in charge and he has the keys over the twin monsters, death and Hades. He has the keys. He has the keys to keep you out. And he has the keys to put people in. And so he is that authority and we want and he wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And we know that we need to do a lot of praying for people around us because they're they don't seem like, you know, there's a there's yet an openness, but God says keep praying because you never know when that time comes and we want to be ready. So then John is equipped. He's like I mean, God had to supernaturally strengthen his wrist, right? Because when he starts writing this out, he's going chapter 1, chapter 2, and all the way to 22. And, and we read that he's like finished. And then the, then the angel says to him, well, you know, don't seal up the book. In other words, it's, it, it's going to take some time for it to be realized. And, um, and so what is God asking us to write? What is God asking us to say? And, um, and he's just saying, be open. That was a beautiful prophecy from Pastor Valerie that you got gifts and those gifts are there given by God that you can show the love of God to people around us. And, you know, people are in deep, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's shocking, you know, how many layers are on the human, you know, family and different things and not all good layers, you know. So we got to... We got to pray him through. We got to we got to stand fast. And and then, you know, we and also we got to be quickened because these things are coming to pass. Literally right now, as we speak, Israel is surrounded by their enemies and this all prophecy. And then they're 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 going to have to fight Lebanon and then they're going to have to fight Syria. And that's Psalms 84. And then all of a sudden Russia is going to get an idea and Russia is going to and they're already teamed up with Iran. And, and the house of Tugara is, is, is Istanbul. It's, it's Turkey. And they're all going to, Ezekiel 38 and 30. I mean, it's unfolding before us. And so um, that's why we're like, whoa, the Lord's coming. But also, who can we influence for the Lord? And also, let's stay away from foolish sin. And let's, you know, really just focus on uh, making our time count, you know. Count down, amen, to eternity, amen. But, you know, like I said, I, I lost my good friend, Jim. Jim Betzel went to be with the Lord. He was 70 years of age. We're, we're like really good friends. I always love fellowshipping, fellow assemblies of God pastor. All of a sudden, pancreatic cancer, and within just boom, boom, a couple of months, he's gone. He's in eternity. And it's like, whoa. Um, but that's just how, how quickly, you know. So why don't we all stand up together and, and we're just really just in awe of the magnificence of Jesus. So maybe we could just lift up our hands to the Lord and, and we respond to him. Lord, thank you. 
Thank you, Lord, for the patience that you that you have in our lives, Lord. Thank you for John's faithfulness, John's humility, the apostle, and thank you, Lord, that he could handle this vision and he had the discipline to write it down verbatim, word for word, and 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 Lord, and he went on to glory, and Lord, we have our race to run, and we're we're praying, Lord, for as as we're getting into the book of Revelations, that Lord, that you will show us, Lord, that that our life is precious and our time is precious and our gifts are precious and 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 we want to be used of god and and we want to be uh lord strong for you filled with the holy spirit and and so lord we're just asking for the blood of jesus over our lives and and the peace of god that surpasses all human understanding and that lord we would be co-laborers with you And bringing in this harvest, Lord, that you have for all of us, Lord, here at Harvest Time and and as families, as individuals. And uh, we just thank you for uh, that you finish things and you finish strong and we're going to finish strong. And uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. And everybody, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer, and then you know if you need special prayer always. We've prayed before, and we're going to pray after the service. But it is nice to conclude, and then you can go to Faith Cafe, but we're always here for prayer. But let's, uh, let's look at that, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. See, you've already memorized that. Most of you, you've memorized that portion. That's the Lord's Prayer. You know it. It's Scripture. So it says, Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory to God. And uh, that's a great one to pray in the morning and throughout the day. (laughs) And then let's look at uh, Philippians 1, 6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. All right. So one more time. Being confident of this very thing. That he that began a good work in you, he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Shake a hand. Give a hug. And uh, we've got, you know, faith cafes.